Hi everyone, so welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue with week three here with probably a little bit of a shorter lecture. Uh, I'm thinking covering uh, starting to compare broadly a lot of the civilizations we've been looking at and a lot of kind of filling in some of the blanks in the map, uh, in the global map of places we haven't really gotten to talk about that much. That's really gonna be the focus of this lecture. Um, this will kind of dovetail or connect to textbook chapter six, page 122 to 140. So if you haven't read that yet, go ahead and read that now before you watch this lecture. And I want to start with this interesting image of a place called Newgrange in Ireland. And I'll go ahead and get my face out of the way here. And Newgrange is a kind of an older Neolithic site in uh, this valley called Boyne in Ireland. And it's one of many, it's one of at least a dozen, maybe up to 20 of these uh, interesting stone and earth sites, the history of which is sort of difficult to unravel and unpack and we don't know everything about it and new things are still being discovered about it. And so this might remind you of some other places that we'll get to in a minute here, but I wanted to start in Newgrange. Um, it's a place that you can kind of go into. You can see a large passage and open space inside of it. And it was really rather recently, uh, only about 20 years ago, I believe, that archaeologists and local experts began to piece together some important connections with the solstice here at Newgrange. And the exact purpose of this thing, this mound structure, has long been unknown. It's probably something related to a burial site, but it is, is it also used as a worship site? Is it a temple? Is it a storehouse, perhaps? Uh, is it related to harvesting? And, uh, an important discovery was made that at the winter solstice, a beam of sunlight will go through one of the passages uh, in this building and shine on one of the burial sites inside. So there does seem to be something to do with ancestor worship and worship of the dead and possibly worship of the sun and moon related to this site. But like with a lot of other old stone structures like this, what we can call megalithic or big stone structures, its exact purpose is largely unknown. Um, continuing on, these are some of the other sites in this Boyne Valley. Uh, and there's a wonderful video you can look at here if you want to, um, that under uh, kind of uh, looks through some of the more recent finds. It's a video from 2018, I think that will tell you about some of the things people have been discovering in this region. Um, and I'll let a, the part of that video run in the background, especially related to what kinds of stones were used, how these stones were moved, and maybe even, and this is the big question, right? What these sites were for and what they did uh, are things that people are still debating and discovering today. This video is a really good one for this. Um, and it's, you know, Unlike some talk of megalithic structures, this is highly scientific and based in reality. We'll get to that also in a minute here. But Newgrange is one of many of these European sites. And if we look at pottery finds, these are some of the places we're going to look at today in the, in the three red circles here. If we look at Neolithic pottery finds, we see that Although we've been focusing on these river valley civilizations uh, in the Cradle of Civilization, the Indus, and the Yellow River, there were people all over Africa and Eurasia, uh, you know, long before these civilizations really came to the fore and that were still there as these civilizations rose. So part of what I want to talk about today is what were these people doing? Maybe why don't we know as much about them as other people and other places in these larger civilizations? Um, and I think this pottery map is useful because it shows you that, yeah, we have artifacts from all over Europe, from you know the Sudan, the Sahara area, Northern Africa, um, Central Asia, and parts of Russia, Siberia, and China, et cetera. 
um, which are not in these places of very concentrated civilization, like we see in Mesopotamia, Indus, Yellow River, um, and others. So there's this question, right, about megalithic Europe. We know people are around in big numbers, and uh, so the question is then, why don't we know as much about these places as we know about the big river valley civilizations? What distinguishes them? What makes it so that we know these places, the Indus, the Cradle of Civilization, Mesopotamia, the Yellow River Valley, so much more? And the reason we don't know about these European sites and some other places that we'll get to later um, is a matter of opinion. You can kind of come up with your own ideas. Uh, one idea might be that environmentally, uh, outside of these various river valley civilizations, it's harder to live. That's one you might hear regularly. Um, outside of these river valley civilizations, we see less writing. That's another reason. Uh, is a, a higher difficulty in uh, getting to text and getting to a direct kind of mind-to-mind -mind understanding of the past, because that's what text lets you do. It lets you kind of learn what someone else was thinking rather directly. Um, but still, we do see these big sites. Stonehenge is probably the most famous, right? Uh, the Dolmen of Guadalperal is an interesting one, uh, often called the Spanish Stonehenge. It was covered up uh, and, and, you know, buried underwater um, after a reservoir was built that covered this site up. And it's actually quite a large site. Uh, and it seems to be similar to Stonehenge in its, you know, shape and possible functions. Um, and it's recently due to climate change, due to a lack of water in this place in Spain where this, this reservoir is, because the reservoir water is lower now, it comes out uh, in summer and it has come out for the past few summers. So you, you be able to see once again, the Dolmen of Guadalperal. Um, and you can read about these places at these links. I'm not gonna talk at length about Stonehenge or the Dolmen of Guadalperal. Um, or the Boyne Valley sites like Newgrange. But uh, I want to point out that these are common things. We see them all over the place, including over in Russia. Um, and the, 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 boy, the, uh, the Russian sites being over here uh, in kind of southwestern Russia uh, on the border of Kazakhstan, there are a few of these sites. Um, and one of them is called Arkham. Um, and I want to use Arkham really briefly as a case study in bad history. You could certainly do the same thing with Stonehenge. People have all kinds of wild ideas about why Stonehenge existed, what it connects to, what it was for. The best guess is, and I'll, I'll stick with Stonehenge for a second here, um, it, it has a variety of potential purposes. Certainly, uh, it could be a ritual site. It probably was a ritual site. It might have been related to seasonal hunting uh, because this was a hunting ground and there are bone deposits of uh, from hunts in the region. It could have done a, a lot to do with the cosmos, right, with connections to the stars. And this is where we start to get uh, off of the edges of reality here. Um, and the same thing happens in Arkame. So Arkame is called Russia's Stonehenge. So we have now Stonehenge, Spain's Stonehenge, Stonehenge and Russia's Stonehenge. It seems like almost everyone gets a Stonehenge uh, after all of these discoveries that we have. This was a site built probably around 1700 BCE by a group of kind of Central Asian, Proto-Indo-Iranians is what they're called. Um, in some cases, uh, in what is now Russia. Um, and we see in this kind of what was probably a walled town, uh, a walled settlement with uh, a rather interesting circular design, probably a moat around it. Um, and it's a highly defended position, it appears. So this could have been for physical defense. It's often called a fortress town or a fortress settlement. Um, and it seems that the reason it looks like this is, is basically because it was a way to protect uh, those who lived here and lived both within and without the walls, kind of circling of the wagons in town form. Uh, and you can read about this if you'd like on your own. You don't have to. But 
this site is uh, sometimes subject to some rather crazy ideas. And, and you may have heard of this very bad television program called Ancient Aliens, which ironically runs on the History Channel, a channel which does not often have much to do with history at all. And I'll run this video in the background to see what they think about it. Um, because the same thing happens with a lot of these sites. Uh, with places in Mayan civilization, for example, with Stonehenge, uh, and here in Russia, we get a lot of wild ideas, um, really random suppositions about the nature of these sites, what they might be connected to and what they might be doing. And in the worst cases of most kind of uh, unanchored thought, I guess you could call it, uh, we often see connections to possible supernatural or extraterrestrial ter connection that are uh, just kind of wild speculation, right? Drawn purely from the imagination, often uh, or almost always of non-experts, people who neither learn the real history of these places or understand them from an archeological or historical perspective. And you can see here some of the really wild stuff that people think where we have a spaceship taking off uh, <laughs> from this site. Uh, and, and it's funny to me, but it's also kind of sad because a lot of people do get their history from sources like this. Um, and Akame and other places like it end up as the nexus for kind of uh, wacky ideas about human origins and uh, the past that have no anchor. So could this be a long lost space alien launch pad? No. And you may know this guy. Um, and, and I would like to remind you that lack of information does not invite uninformed speculation. And this guy is on the same program later. He's kind of a living meme of pseudoscience and pseudo history. But uh, this is important. This lack of information is important because the reason why these people have all these crazy ideas uh, is because we don't know a lot of the past of these places. We don't have as much data, as much information, especially written information, as we get in the more populated, more densely populated places like Mesopotamia or the Indus and Ganges civilizations, the Yellow River civilization, Karal Supe, as we saw last time. Um, we get less information about some of these sites that are kind of outside of the big population centers of the ancient world. So there are still people there, but this makes us ask a more grounded question, not uh, is it because of aliens? No, it's not because of aliens. The question is why are some histories longer and more detailed than others? Uh, and there can be lots of reasons. But I have a, a graphic here for you that de demonstrates this from my home uh, region of study of Japan, China, and Korea. As we know from last, uh, last week, um, China has a much longer history than Japan or Korea. Uh, and here we're starting with the Qin, which we will get to later, but all of the history we studied for China actually happens about a thousand years before this graph or this timeline even begins. It's much older. And for Japan, we have very minimal knowledge up until really the Nara period or the late Kofun tomb period. We have very little knowledge. Knowledge of Japan really gets going around 600 where we can start to say a lot of things about Japanese civilization. We start to see writing come in. So for Japan, writing is a key. And the same thing happens with Korea. We just have the old Choson um, and it is kind of a murky history and unknown history in large part until we get to, uh, you know, around the turn of the first millennium. Um, around the switch from BCE to CE or BC to AD. And I, I don't care which of those you use, by the way. Um, and, but China goes back much longer. And a big part of that is uh, China was a denser civilization with more people. Uh, it had a writing system, uh, the foundations of a writing system, at least. Um, and it has a lot more traceable uh, information because of those two things in confluence. We could also talk about the environment a little bit in some of these places. 
for example, as I think I mentioned a little while ago, Northern Europe is a lot colder and harder to live in than say Mesopotamia. To farm in Northern Europe, for example, you would have to deal number one with seasonality, with cold weather coming and killing your crops once a year or, or more. Um, and also with dense forests, Europe was actually highly densely forested. So you'd have to clear a lot of trees which is quite a bit harder than building on a plains or a river floodplain that doesn't have huge thick tree trunks to deal with. Mostly just plants you would have to, you know, shrubs and bushes and some smaller trees that you'd have to clear to, uh, to plant, uh, you know, plant your food, plant your crops. The uh, river itself in these cases, in these river valley civilizations, is doing some of that land clearance for you because when it floods, it clears out a lot of the big plants. This is not the case in other parts of the world, northern Europe, the steppe, much of Central Asia and what will become Russia, um, big chunks of Africa. We think of Africa as hot and dry, but you have to remember that the Great Rift Valley, which we'll talk about just a little bit towards the end of this lecture, was actually a densely forested uh, and greener place. Uh, and much of Africa is quite green today also. So uh, the, the place where humans originated actually was harder to grow crops in than the cradle of civilization, which is probably why it's the cradle of civilization. Right. So this is the environmental explanation, which I am partial to as an environmental historian. That's one of my specialties. And it's also important to look at these two questions. So when we look at why did or didn't something happen, that is actually a very different question from why don't we know about what happened? One is about predicting the past and what happened and the meaning of it. And one is about our access to information. So it's actually very easy to mix up these questions. It's a good idea to keep them separate because when we ask why didn't civilization explode in Northern Europe in the way it did in the Middle East, that's, that's a different question than why don't we know anything about Stonehenge, for example, uh, in terms of why was it built? We don't have any direct writing or other direct evidence of its purpose. And that's why it's one of these great mysteries with all of the wackiness that comes with that. Um, and so these are very different questions. They can be related, but they're not the same thing. And it's good to keep that in mind. Um, let's jump into the text just a little bit. I'm not going to repeat what the text tells you, and you should definitely be reading the text. I'm not going to cover, the text talks about a number of small kingdoms in Africa, uh, as well as in the Americas today, and I'm not going to go into each one of those. The text covers them, gives you a couple of paragraphs, maybe a couple of pages on these, um, and you should read about that on your own so that you have that information. It doesn't make sense for me to just read it to you again, essentially. Um, but to talk about uh, Africa more broadly, we see from in the, the text is covering this period of 600 BCE to 600 CE, which is a period of slow development in the less populated areas. So we have Egypt in the north and the cradle of civilization uh, and the Fertile Crescent as a part of that, extending outward into the Middle East into uh, Mesopotamia. And that is a very densely populated area. Lots of people living there, lots of city-states and cities and towns, what we would call towns, I guess, um, and also villages. Whereas further south in Africa is less densely populated. Smaller villages, small village networks, um, rising and falling over time, they're more difficult to trace in part because there is less physical evidence of the past there, simply because there were fewer people and smaller sites. Um, so like in, like in Northern Europe, we see lots of people, there is herding, there's farming, there is uh, animal husbandry, there are towns and some cities, uh, but there isn't this critical mass, as I call it here, to uh, create this more populous and major civilization. Kerma is the biggest city in Africa outside of Egypt, um, and it's to the south of Egypt in the Great Rift Valley area. Um, and it is eventually conquered by New Kingdom Egypt. 
So another thing to think about when you're looking at uh, places outside of these major civilizations, especially those that kind of neighbor them, maybe a few hundred miles away, is that over time, their histories as independent places, like the, the history of Kerma before Egypt, is in some ways eclipsed or erased by the invasion and conquest by Egypt, by the larger power in the region. So that's another reason we don't know as much about some of these other areas, is as empires grow and predominate, they kind of build over top of pre-existing places, like we saw in Mesopotamia. Uh, you know, one settlement from an Akkadian might later become a Babylonian, etc. Uh, and, and this was very common. And it's common in other places in the world. This model of Kerma is quite interesting. You can see it was a pretty large town with, uh, you, can, you can guess just from this that there is some social stratification, there is some division of labor because people are living in different size structures. You can infer that directly here. We have a, a large central structure and I don't know a lot about Kerma at all uh, and, and you can study it and you'll know more than me in just an hour or so. But you can see just from this diagram or this model of Kerma, that it is a complex society. Uh, it's walled in. It has various structures for various different purposes. And uh, it is quite extensive for a, a town from 4,000 years ago or a city from 4,000 years ago. And this is a model held by or built by the National Museum of Sudan. Um, and you can read a bit more about New Kingdom Egypt here, too, uh, which we probably won't get into too deeply in this, uh, in this course. The book might talk about it a little bit more later on. Um, and so then we see much later, around 600 BCE to 600 CE, that 1200-year period, um, something the book calls the Bantu or Bantu expansion. I'm not sure the pronunciation. Um, and... Bantu or Bantu is a linguistic uh, shift. So coming from around the area of Nigeria, Cameroon, um, is a group of people who were prospering up north and uh, likely, we don't know exactly why they were moving across Africa, especially south into the Great Rift Valley and further south through you know, the Congo into Angola. Uh, probably they were moving southward because they were uh, doing so well in their home region that, you know, people were uh, abundant and they needed to move to greener pastures. One of the great, you know, common reasons why people would move around the earth uh, even today is that uh, populations were booming, but the land could only sustain so many people. So you'd move on down the road or, you know, you build the road as you move. So this is uh, a series of migrations, possibly invasions um, from more developed areas of northwestern Africa into uh, south and southeastern Africa. So this is south of the Egyptian kingdom um, and south of the Sahara. Uh, what is the, the kind of nomadic groups in the Sahara that we studied, I think, on the very first day uh, a little bit? And one of the reasons that the Great Rift, as I mentioned a minute ago, did not see as much population uh, initially was because like in Northern Europe, deforestation is needed to plant there. Uh, you know, at 600 BCE to 600 CE, this is an area that has a lot of trees. There are still quite a few uh, forests and jungles in this part of Africa today. And so to plant there, you have to clear the land in a way you don't have to do in a river plain, which is clearing it for you, like I already said. Uh, and this map is on page 129 of the textbook. But I wanna just really quickly move through today. I'm gonna try to keep this lecture short. Moving back to the Americas, I wanna talk very briefly about the Mayans. Um, this is the Great Pyramid at Chichen Itza, a place I've been lucky enough to go myself uh, when I was uh, in high school, I believe. I went there um, with my family, and it is uh, a remarkably large structure. Uh, I wish they had people in this picture, but a person is shorter than this first large step by, uh, you know, maybe about a third of this first step or so is the height of a person, maybe half. Uh, and this is a 
a, a great uh, complex. It's not just one pyramid. I'm going to show a little bit of it in the background. Someone has a drone, a uh, piece of drone footage here that I'm going to show. You can see this great complex of Chichen Itza. Um, and there are lots and lots of theories about the Mayans, uh, some as wild and uh, off the map as we saw earlier in Russia. But the Mayan civilization is very important to the history of Americas because it is probably America's first great kingdom, or you might even call it an empire. Um, and there are lots of sites like Chichen Itza. None quite as big. I think Chichen Itza is one of the larger ones. But there are lots of other sites kind of like this. Um, and Mayans is, in fact, a catch-all term for multiple related peoples who were speaking related but separate dialects, but probably using a similar written language or unified written language. Let's get into this a little bit. Across this Yucatan Peninsula in Central America here, um, just south of the Gulf of Mexico is here. Mexico would be up here if it were on the map. Um, we see all of these temple and kind of uh, city compounds, a mix of temples and cities and other buildings all across the Yucatan Peninsula, many of which uh, have been discovered recently or are still only partially discovered. Often they're covered um, in uh, forestation and other plant life and jungle. And so we don't even know everything about all of these sites at all, not even close. Um, this is a vast set of related, culturally related uh, sites. We don't always know if they were all unified together. As I said, there are multiple language groups and we could probably identify multiple peoples within the Mayans. Um, but this is a huge kind of kingdom. Um, and at least a lot of it is belonging to the same political powers. Um, we have a lot of useful facts about the Mayans in the textbook, which talks about them in kind of uh, a five or six page chunk. Um, we know they were writing, they were writing on paper-like strips of tree bark, kind of a thicker paper. Um, most of that has been lost over time because obviously, you know, uh, going back many hundreds uh, to 1500 to several thousand years ago at the very earliest, um, these pieces of paper or, or thicker bark paper would kind of waste away in some cases. There were caches of these papers found by conquistadors and other European invaders, and they burned them. So uh, some of them were destroyed deliberately. Um, by invaders from Europe, but we do have quite a bit of remaining information about the Mayans, which makes them uh, easier to study than some other uh, peoples that we've been talking about today. I have some examples of what their writing looked like down here on the bottom of the screen. It's kind of a hieroglyphic style of writing, um, and the, the meaning of these symbols, the first one, the sky, second one is a king, an ahau, the uh, third one is a house. The fourth is a child. I like the child one. You can see a bird uh, with a smaller bird inside its mouth, a baby bird. So it's a child. And the city of Palanque. Um, and there are about 800 of these characters in total, most of which we understand and know the meaning of. Um, and you can learn about the language here at this link. Uh, it's a Canadian, uh, the Canadian Museum of History. Uh, which has a really good uh, kind of lengthy article about the language. There are lots of other sources for learning about the Mayan language if you're interested. Um, and I would remind you that if you're interested in some of these things, you could, uh, you could look at something from Mayan script, Mayan text, for your source analysis at the end of the term. And you could look at some of these structures if you wanted to for your object analysis paper, which is coming up in a, a few more weeks here around midterm time. Um, but anyway, the Mayan civilization is quite important because it gives us an empire, a kingdom active in the Americas um, from 600 BCE to 600 CE, at least. Um, some estimates, I mean, Mayan culture obviously has longer roots than that. They go back further. Some estimates put the Mayans at significantly earlier than this. I'm sharing the textbooks uh, 
timeline here. The textbook says 600 BCE to 600 CE. Some of Mayan civilization existed before 600 BCE, but the real height of the kingdom, or possibly you could even call it an empire, is 600 to 600 again. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today on these kind of various comparisons. You're going to be doing some of these comparisons in your discussion. Um, and so discussion leaders in a couple more days after I'm recording this video uh, on, I believe on the day that this video is technically scheduled to be put out, I'll probably put it out a day early. Um, but discussion leaders should post your questions to Blackboard by the end of the day on the 19th. Um, and then by the end of the day on the 22nd, which is Sunday, um, you should all respond to those questions. And also make sure you turn in your first short response, that quiz number one, the thing I handed out in class uh, before the shutdown. So you've had quite a while to work on that now. I've extended it because of the shutdown and because of all the kind of problems you may be dealing with, with getting online and uh, getting your schedules worked out right now. So go ahead and get that into me by Sunday at the end of the night and respond to the discussion questions. Our next lecture for next week, and I think it will be the main lecture for next week, and there will be another short one that I'll put out relating to your uh, material objects uh, papers, is on Persia, Greece, and Rome in brief. So that's another, another day with a whole lot of uh, stuff to cover, and I'll try to cover it as quickly as I can. Um, and then you should, sorry about that, you should also be reading textbook chapter 7, page 145 to 157. And we'll have our student-led discussion also for next week. All right, so thank you very much, everyone. I will see you next time.